Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this teleseminar webinar on um, how to sleep and what are some of our concerns around sleep. You know, sleep is, an, is a, a major issue. We've got some statistics here. 50 to 70 million Americans, 30% of Americans have sleep disorders. Um, in one poll, 38% only 38% of Americans actually had uh, eight hours of sleep. That was in 2001 and 2009. That number went down to 28%. Um, in one major study, and we've written about this, you probably know about this, is that we need about seven to eight hours of sleep. If you get less than seven towards six or more, it's not actually good. If you actually get less than seven to eight hours sleep, it actually... Um, um, actually increases the risk of mortality from all causes. We know that, uh, that not sleeping is one of the, the major stressors in our life. And here's the catch-22, right? The more you don't sleep, the more stressed you get. And the more stressed you get, you all know this, right? The less we sleep. <clears throat> so it's important for us to try to figure out how to uh, deal with the stress. And as we're going to get into here, there's four major things that I'm going to try to cover tonight that are that are causative factors to not sleeping well. One of them is um, exhaustion. Next one is stress. We're going to talk about that. Blood sugar issues and gene noise, genetic noise. We're going to talk about how that blocks our ability to connect with our own circadian rhythm. So there's a lot to talk about. The first one, exhaustion. People don't realize that our brain actually uses more energy. It's busier. It's actually doing more work while we're sleeping than when we're awake. So from that perspective, we need energy to support that. We also need energy to sedate ourselves and go to sleep and stay asleep. So the, the underlying factor with sleep issues is we're exhausted. And we have a culture of exhaustion. We push too hard, we work really hard, we crash and burn, we stimulate ourselves to get enough energy to get through the day. All these play an important cumulative role in our inability to sleep well, our inability to reconnect with those, those, uh, those natural rhythms. The, our genes literally cannot hear the circadian rhythms in nature. Ayurveda, the whole system of Ayurveda is sort of this bridge between, you know, our cells, our genetic ability to hear the rhythms of nature, our microbial ability to hear the natural cycles of nature, and the natural cycles of nature, the circadian rhythms. So our, gene our genes are designed to listen and connect up with those rhythms. But stress and exhaustion and blood sugar issues are the three major things that get in our way that block our ability to hear that. So that's what I want to talk about is how to sort of unravel some of those blocks that are keeping us from connecting up with those rhythms. Because I think all of us know, at least if you don't know, um, uh, it's well documented that we are all designed to sleep during the day, during the night, and be awake uh, during the day. In a, a couple of new studies that came out recently uh, in the British uh, Medical Journal, show that they measured shift workers, people who actually did a lot of shift work, which means working at night. And then, um, you know, being up during the day um, or, or trying to sleep during the day and working at night. And they found some interesting things that, that when people, and they measured it was like 3,200 people. Half the group were shift workers and half the group wasn't shift working. And they measured, their, their, uh, they measured them five and ten years out if they were doing shift work for that long. And they found that the people who were doing shift work for a long period of time had significant reduction in mental cognitive function and significant decrease in productivity that affects safety. They actually made cases, direct links towards uh, major accidents like um, the Valdez oil spill, Chernobyl, 
and uh, Three Mile Island. All those accidents were done at night with, with shift workers who were exhausted and they, 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 they link uh, at least a part of those accidents to shift work lack of productivity. Now, in one study, in that same study, they found that there were, according to the uh, Federal Motor Safety Carrier Administration, there are 750 deaths and 20,000 accidents a year due to overtired uh, vehicle drivers. And they found that when people actually are doing shift work for 10 years, that these problems take five years. Once that they stopped uh, doing shift work, it takes five years for their nervous systems to recover. And that's sort of, you know, you know one of the studies that kind of led a lot of credibility to this whole idea that we're supposed to be asleep during the night and up during the day. And when you go against the grain of that, even if we feel that we're in a rhythm and we adapt to it, it's, um, it's, there, there's a subtle inability for us to link up to our natural rhythms, which support health. In that study, they found that, which I thought was interesting too, I forgot to mention, was they found that, that people who were shift workers who lost that connection to, for their cells to hear the circadian rhythms, for the genes to hear the circadian rhythms, they had significantly more health and social problems, ulcers, cardiovascular disorders, twice the risk of breast cancer, metabolic syndrome, which is like a big blood sugar thing, and reproductive difficulties all linked to shift work not to mention the safety issues that cause some pretty global disasters. So point being, we got to sleep at night and, and, be up during the, and be up during the day. Now, there are many factors to, uh, to, that we have to talk about with regard to the exhaustion and things that we can do when we're exhausted. We need energy to sedate ourselves. So right off the bat, there's things we can do to reboot our energy reserves, pay off some of the debt. Um, perhaps my favorite herb in this department is an herb called ashwagandha with ania somifera, which literally means to sleep actually. And it's an herb that you can take to give you energy in the morning and also sedate yourself at night. So you could take this herb before you in the morning and go run a marathon and, and be very, very functional, have lots of energy and stamina and endurance, which is what it's for. And it also, you can take it before you go to bed at night and give you the energy to sedate yourself and sleep like a baby. In our world, that we have a very stressful world, we have um, things that are called adaptogens. Adaptogens are herbs that help us adapt to stress. And they're not abundant in nature. Uh, what is abundant in nature are stimulants. So when we're exhausted and run down, our brain pulls down the menu and says, how do I get out of this hole? to get more energy. And I usually it's some list of stimulants to give me the energy that I need to go to sleep, the energy I need to make it through the day. And these issues, uh, these be create issues with regard to our inability to have, um, to the energy we need to maintain normal function without the stimulant. We borrow from Peter to pay Paul, we go further and further into debt, and we have to keep shoveling ourselves out. So we have a culture of caffeine stimulation, of energy drinks, uh, our stimulants that we see all the time, uh, even activities being overstimulated by exercise or by work or by shopping or by TV or by video games or by you sort of name it, we have a culture of significant and severe overstimulation, which uh, I think is not so good for us. And it creates a level of deep, deep exhaustion. So we need herbs that are what are considered adaptogenic, herbs that help the body adapt to stress. And those are the ones that you can always tell because if you take it before you go to bed, you're wired for sound. You want to take an herb that allows you to sleep, but not a sedative because a sedative is sedating an already exhausted system so if you are if the number one cause of insomnia is because you're actually exhausted and then you sedate yourself to sleep then you're sedating an already sedated system making yourself more exhausted which usually leaves most folks who end up doing that um, pretty uh, not feeling drugged or really dull or, or just overly sedated when they wake up. 
the idea is that we want to um, pay back this debt, not sedate it even further. So we don't want to sedate a system that's already been sedated. We want to rebuild and rejuvenate. So, so you want to take an herb that is not a sedative and one that is not a stimulant because we want to stimulate you either uh, because that obviously, you, a lot of people are who, of course, can't sleep at night. They wake up in the morning exhausted because they couldn't sleep and then they want a stimulant to get through the day and i totally get that we sort of need to probably do some of that just to be functional in the world but i want to lay out you know sort of how this is becomes a very difficult problem to unravel because we're damned if we do and damned if we don't and if we could actually you know do something along the lines of deep deep rejuvenation and there's a handful of them ashwagandha may be the best adaptogen it gives you energy in the morning and it can help you sleep at night an herb called brahmi go to cola another herb that can give you energy in the morning and help you sleep at night another herb called shagpushpi uh, a great herb that uh, is that gives you the energy in the morning and helps you sleep at night uh, another herb called tulsi uh, another herb that can give you energy in the morning and help you sleep at night uh, passion flower and skull cap these are all herbs that are, again, adaptogenic. Things like ginseng and ginkgo, which we think are, are actually stimulants in disguise, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of them because they just give you the sense that you're feeling better, but you're actually borrowing more money going further and further into debt. So we don't want to do that. Now, there are, there are two types of insomnia that most people have. One is uh, uh, the inability to get to sleep, and then the second one is the inability to stay asleep. The inability to get to sleep is oftentimes what we call a pitta-based insomnia. People who have pitta body types tend to be more vulnerable to this. Pitta is fire, competitive, driven. Uh, pitta body types are the ones that um, uh, right around 9.30 at night, they start getting a second wind and they're boom, they're up till two o'clock, changing the world on the internet, watching movies, having midnight snacks. That's, you know who you are. That's the pitta, you know, type of insomnia. You can't get to sleep very, very well. The pitta time of night is between 10 o'clock at night and two o'clock in the morning. This is when the liver becomes more active to produce uh, enzymes that help detoxify the body like glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase, really powerful enzymes in your liver that activate and are produced <coughs> in a bigger way between 10 o'clock and two, which is very interesting. So basically what happens is the liver around 10 o'clock at night is sort of like the janitor comes in, he wants to wash the floors and clean the windows and prepare the office for the next day or prepare your body for the next day, okay? Now, people who have an imbalance of pitta, which means overstimulated, too much activity, too much video game, too much violent movie, too much stress, too much activity, stimulate, 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 or then, or because you are addicted to the high of the stimulation, you need an injection to get you there, you're then addicted to caffeine or five-hour energy or, or energy drinks or some chocolate or sugar or something to get you out of that hole up to a place where you feel normal or reasonable. These are pitta tendencies to really love and thrive on the stimulation. And unfortunately, uh, the more you stimulate that individual, they can literally burn out. And that's sort of what happens to pitta body types is they literally burn out. Their nature is to be hot and fiery and too much of that can burn themselves out. So now what happens is they don't have the energy to sedate themselves in that pitta time of night. Um, so they can't get underneath the janitors washing and cleaning and making noise. We can't get the nervous system to sedate and get underneath that so we stay sort of wired for sound. We take that, that pitta ride into the wee hours of the night, changing the world on the internet. Um, a lot of folks think that I'm just a night person and that is just not reality. There is no such thing as night people. There are pitta people who, <laughs> who get easily stimulated into the wee hours of the night between 10 o'clock and two and they, and they feel great at that time. I was, I'm a pitta body type, and when I was in college, I didn't know any better, and I would study, if I, went to, if I studied at 
7 or 8 o'clock in the, in the evening, I would fall asleep because that's what we call the kapha time of the night. In fact, in the kapha time of the night, between 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, kapha is a heavy energy. It's a sedative energy, trying to lower your cortisol from, which is a stress-fighting hormone, from the stimulation of the day. That's maybe the most important time for us pitta types, or a lot of types, as we'll see here in a minute, who can't sleep at night, because that's the time to sedate and bring this system into balance, because if we don't get the system to sedate before the janitor comes in at 10 o'clock, boom, you're wired for sound, and if you're a pitta body type, it's very difficult. And if you're a pitta body that's overstimulated yourself into exhaustion, we now just stacked on top of this imbalance. One, the exhaustion, one, the overstimulation, and now we don't have any energy to sedate ourselves down into that deeper uh, sleep that we desperately need. Uh, hopefully, I'm making some sense. So the pitta body types, they really want to take time to sedate themselves in the early evening, start to wind down in the early evening. I always say for, the, for all body types really, to, if you can't sleep well, take out a boring book at around 9.30, okay? Not my book, of course, because you'll be up all night reading, of course. But if you were to take out a boring book, um, I would read my ch my kids a story for many years, and you know, at eight o'clock at night. And I and not to say that those books were boring, but but um, they would put me to sleep like that. And they're like, "Come on, Dad, wake up! Tell me more stories." And I'm like, "I can't even open my eyes," you know. And I would then fall asleep with them. It's a natural time to fall asleep, but. If you wait till 10 o'clock when that fiery energy janitor cleaning, detoxifying the body, get ready for the next day energy kicks in, then you're off on that, that 10 to 2 energy wave and sometimes it's hard to then settle it back down. So be aware of that. I used to travel around years ago and do Ayurveda consultations around the country. Uh, that was when I first came back from India. I was working with Deepak Chopra and we used to travel around together and do lectures and I used to do a lot of pulse diagnosis Ayurveda consultations. And I had this one guy who's in Washington, D.C. Maybe he's listening. And, um, and uh, he had a problem where he would he would uh, wake up every morning with a headache. It was a really severe headache, and uh, I took his pulse and tried to diagnose it. And I gave him some herbs, and of course they didn't really work. I came back three months later. He said they didn't really work. I, I tried something else and and gave him some other therapies. The next time I saw him, and, and that didn't work either. And then the third time I saw him, I looked at him and I said, what time do you go to bed? And I could I felt like an idiot asking this because this is the sort of stuff I should ask the very first time. And um, he said, I go to bed around two or three in the, in the morning, in, in, in the night. And I said, what time do you wake up? He goes, around 10 or 11. And I said, wow. I said, why don't you go to bed at 9.30, take out a boring book, of course not my book, and, and, and then try, and as soon as you start to feel sleepy from that book, just turn off the light, get everything ready so nothing else, lights are on the house, and just turn off the light and go to sleep. And then, when you wake up, first, when your eyes open at 5.05 in the morning or 6.06, .06, whatever it is, when your eyes open naturally, get out of bed. I don't care if you're tired. I don't care if you're having a great dream. Just get out of bed. And, and I said, and, and, and let me know how you do. Two weeks later, he called me up and he said, John, guess what? Because I slept through the night. It was fantastic. I slept great. And I woke up without a headache for the first time in 10 years. I couldn't remember last time I didn't have a headache when I woke up. Then he proceeded to yell at me because I had... I, I didn't tell him that the first time or the second time, and he thought, he said, you were just trying to get my money. I'm like, well, really, if I had ever could have just solved that problem with, you know, go to bed early uh, and wake up early, uh, boy, I would have done that in a heartbeat. But sometimes it's, it, and I know for a lot of you, and I know this, is, this has become very complicated sleep, but uh, um, what I'm talking about are the, the, the building blocks of, you know, this, this inability to sleep and how we really have to understand how it, how it starts to accumulate. So step one, get to bed early. In the early part of the evening, in the kapha time of night, this is a really important time because you can take a hot bath, you can do an oil massage, you can meditate, do some very gentle yoga, you can, you know, get in your bed and meditate. 
create an environment in your bedroom that is so incredibly what we call sattvic in Ayurveda. It's peaceful and calming. No TV in your bedroom. No paying bills in your bedroom. These are Ayurvedic principles, by the way. No uh, yelling or arguing in your bedroom. No, you know, aggressive behavior. No video games. It's a place where you feel completely comfortable with the proper lighting and, you know, everything has to be in your bedroom, a place where you feel safe, safe to just be completely at rest. It's very important um, to not have TVs in your bedroom and even, an, even a computer in your bedroom. Very, very important. A lot of people have Wi-Fi signals going nee, 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 all over their house. It's just crazy what happens in our houses. And it's very important, I think, to rig up some master switch where you flick off the Wi-Fi at night and zzz, your whole body settles down and you become less stimulated. Lots of research is becoming, and a lot of folks are just very sensitive to that. A lot of you say, oh, that's just crazy, and kids sleep with their cell phones next to their heads. I mean, really, you know, there are some new studies that are coming out showing up that our microbes don't like cell phones. They don't like or understand this technology and the electromagnetics. They like, they like the woods, they like forests, they like nature, they like to be still. They survive and proliferate with uh, a peaceful environment. They disappear, the good microbes do, when you're stressed out and all worked up. They are affected by our environment. If you're in a stressful environment, your good bugs actually you know, become less abundant and your bad bugs proliferate. We know this. And in Ayurveda, you know, the whole idea of being peaceful and relaxing and calm and giving and caring and loving is to create a sattvic experience of life, which they knew over thousands of years of, of observation created a, an environment where people thrived. And in stressful situations, whether it be war times, or whatever, people didn't thrive as well. So they didn't know that there were microbes back then, but they knew everything, it seems like, about how to keep the microbes alive in your system. And you can bank on the fact that there are microbes that support better sleep, better mood, and handling stress. We know, we know that already. I don't know if they found the exact microbe for sleep, but they know that there's significant microbes that support stress and mood and ability to cope with stress and handle stress. Those are real facts. And we just have to start thinking, is my life you know, sattvic or not. I wrote an article called, What is Your Emotional Body Type? It's a questionnaire. Go fill out that questionnaire. See if your body is, if you're more sattvic in your behavior, which is peaceful and calm and loving, and therefore microbial supporting in nature, or uh, aggressive and stressful, uh, which is, you know, not so good for our bugs. And, and that's a rajasic stimulated uh, style of behavior. And then, of course, there's, there's this, the, the tamasic behavior, which is when we become so overstimulated, we just sort of want to withdraw, retreat, and check out of the world and disappear and numb ourselves with drugs or alcohol and just don't want to feel anymore. I think we all know, we've all tasted that. And when you, when you take the questionnaire, you can go, oh, I'm more you know, tamasic in this part of my life and more rajasic in this part of my life. And I have great so, you know, sattvic behavior in these parts. It might just tune you into where in your life you might want to do some scrubbing because there's no doubt that, you know, that this kind of behavior of stress is so prevalent. I want to, I, I dug up some studies for this call and I thought, I just was blown away when I read the research on this. I, I just thought it was amazing that almost every single study had to do with, you know, sleep issues being related to stress. <clears throat> I'll read a couple of them to you. Um, those with insomnia reported significantly more negative life events, such as losses and illness during the year prior to the onset of insomnia. And many specifically attributed their insomnia to a major life event. In another perspective study of young adults assessed uh, over a seven year period, those who experienced more frequent negative life events and interpersonal conflicts were more likely to have occasional insomnia and repeated bouts of brief insomnia. In addition, a Finnish study um, <clears throat> found that, that uh, psychological or, or psychosocial stressors were more likely to be associated with insomnia um, um, <clears throat> than were health problems. So it was their stress emotionally, psychosocial stress, was more of a factor for their insomnia than health problems were. 
um, indicating a strong link between stress and sleep. Uh, although major, here's an important, interesting point I thought, although major stressful events can trigger insomnia, chronic exposure to minor stressors, which we all have, right, may also contribute to an increased risk for insomnia and may be particularly important in the genesis of chronic sleep disturbance. And I think that's the point I'm trying to make, is that chronic stressors in your life accumulate um, and build up to becoming chronic sleep issues. And I think that's what, when you really have trouble, it's like, we got to dissect this and see how we stack stress, 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 stress. We lost our connection to those rhythms. And now the, the nervous system, the genetic kind of signal say, hey, it's time to go to sleep. It's sleep dark. Sun went down. Like, why are you not sleeping? That connection is lost because of stress. And there's good studies that I wrote about. I think in the, in the newsletter today, I gave you the reference for how we, I call it genetic noise can block the genes from hearing these rhythms. I think that's just profound how, how it happens at such a deep level. Uh, in one study in Japan, insomnia was significantly correlated with daily stress levels, whereas exercise helped, um, uh, stress levels didn't. In a study of over 3,400 male servants in Japan, they, they measured three different aspects of insomnia, difficulty starting sleeping, difficulty staying asleep, and the quality of sleep itself. Those are the three major pieces of sleep that we look for. And higher perceived stress, okay? The consideration of life as not meaningful, worth living, and a variety of job-related stressors showed the strongest independent associations with insomnia complaints. It goes on to say family stressors, emotional stressors. It was a whole lot to do with emotions, work stressors, sitting next to someone you don't like, emotional stressors. Those were the ones that stack up. So if I had to like fast forward to the thing that's going to give you the most benefit for hand for kind of unraveling all the stress. Yes, adaptogenic herbs are good. Yes, a lifestyle in sync with mother nature is powerful. If you don't know what that is, I, we have a whole course called the 28 day Ayurvedic challenge where every day for 28 days, and you can take it every other day, whatever you want, but there's 28 videos, 28 PDFs, 28 exercises, homework plans for you to employ a new Ayurvedic lifestyle program into your life. So you can actually begin to live and experience Ayurveda, what it is to live a sattvic lifestyle. It's profound. And now we have great studies to show that it has a powerful effect on our microbiology. Very, very important. Yoga has been and meditation has been shown has been shown to decrease anxiety and depression and support sleep. Powerful, powerful tools that we all should understand. And they're also yeah, I know, I know that we can't go stress out all day long and then come home and do a yoga class and expect it to solve our problems, but we have to look at sort of the bigger picture and see how we can build a new platform, a foundation of, of stability and nervous system strength and resiliency and silence in the midst of the activity. I call it that, I always call that the hurricane effect. So you can be living in a very busy world around you, but inside you're calm, meaning that your nervous system is not overstimulated, which means that your rhythms on the inside are connected to the rhythms on the outside, that your genes can literally hear and connect with these cycles of nature. It sounds crazy, I know, but that's where science is going. It's going and proving that mother nature got us here and mother nature can solve our problems. And that is the science of Ayurveda. And we have great modern science now to sort of support that. Um, Meditation, a powerful tool to still the mind and teach the nervous system how to be calm. I have to say, though, that most meditation techniques don't take us far enough. Meditation is a great tool of awareness. It makes you more self-aware. So you can become, you know, and, and, the, and the benefits of just meditating and doing nothing else but closing your eyes and stilling your mind with a good meditation practice are phenomenal. I can't even emphasize that enough. You know, we have measurements of longevity. They can measure your telomeres, the little, little parts of your chromosomes. And they found that when you meditate, that they increase the, the rebuilding of your telomeres, of your chromosomal caps, uh, as a measure of longevity by 43% in one study and 30% in another study. Powerful benefits for longevity. But what I have found, and when I read the Vedic texts, 
Ayurveda, yoga, breathing, every, all these are tools for awareness so you become aware of what your crazy mind has conjured up in the name of protective patterns of behavior. And those protective patterns stress you out. And we process that stress through our gut. And guess who's in there? All your microbes that support mood stability and neurotransmitters that support the ability to handle stress like water off a duck's back. And if you're not handling stress well, then of course that impacts you, depletes your adrenals, produces your, all your blood sugar hormones, can affect your thyroid function, can even mess with your reproductive hormones. And all of that leaves you so depleted that you don't have the ability to make stress-fighting hormones any longer. And then you have this, I'm out of gas program, and I don't have, therefore, the energy to create what I need to sedate myself and keep myself sedated through the night. I hope that's not too much to say all at once, but that's the power of, of, of what happens. So we need a meditation technique to help you not only become more self-aware of the problems, but they teach you how to take action to lay down new neural pavement to not drive down the same old stressful roads we've been driving down our whole entire lives. <clears throat> Meditation is an awareness tool. There's an old saying in Ayurveda that says, first establish being silence, the eye of the hurricane, that calm, and then perform action. And only when you perform action do we actually lay down new neural pavement and drive down new roads. Most of us drive down roads that we've been driving down in terms of emotional stress. We go home for the holidays and see our family react, start acting like a four-year-old again. We just reactivate the same old reactive stressful patterns, emotional stress. And we do that 24-7 in many cases. And it drives us crazy, doesn't make us happy. So we then turn towards money, power, fame, drugs, coffee, stimulants, shopping, stuff like that to get satisfied. But because this old protective pattern of behavior that we created as a child isn't serving us any longer. So Ayurveda, yoga, breathing, meditation were awareness tools designed to give you the ability to take action to free yourself from these old patterns. And that's what I found so frustrating was I never saw a meditation technique that takes you beyond just the meditation. And it's required to take action. So I created a course called the Transformational Awareness Course Technique, which is a technique, a meditation course you take is six weeks online. We have like 17 videos, PDFs and all that to give you the tools to not only learn how to meditate and be successful at it, but to take transformational action steps to lay down new pavement in your brain to be free. And I really mean that. If you don't lay down pavement in your life, you can think about making a mark on a wall, but until you go with the marker and make the mark on the wall, there's no mark on the wall. You haven't made a change in this world, in this environment. And that is a requirement for us to change the stress pattern that's taken out our nervous system, taken out our adrenals. Our adrenals get depleted. They borrow money from your reproductive hormones like your testosterone and progesterone. That affects reproductive strength, libido, and ability to get pregnant and stay pregnant, your ability to even want to have a baby or, or have sex. It affects your, your ability to, to, to make more stress-fighting hormones. We then borrow money from our, our blood sugar and we become sugar addicts to get the energy to stimulate us to make the energy we desperately need. And then we borrow money from our thyroid, which stimulate more metabolism to make us feel better. But that depletes our thyroid and that can disturb again all of that, whether it be you know inability to make stress fighting hormones from reproductive support, from blood sugar support or thyroid support, all that can be complete, can become depleted. So you just simply can't muster the energy to sedate the system that it needs. Or from the perspective of feeding your nervous system with the energy it needs because it's actually, studies show, it's busier at night than it is during the day. That's a hard one for me even to get my head around. So, so here we go, right? It's just about learning and employing the tools to have stress. And meditation should be something that you look forward to doing, not something that you have to do. Yoga, same way. It can be so, oftentimes it's such an exercise fitness workout, not to say that exercise and doing yoga in a fitness way is bad, but sometimes it just feeds the overstimulation that many of us have. So if you're a pitta body type and doing pitta, hot yoga, very stimulated way, then you might not be doing the thing that you need the best. What you might need is cool, calming, restorative yoga. You might need a meditation practice that stills your mind during the day. So we start setting up in the, in the, uh, 
in the uh, nervous system a permission to be calm and composed. So the pitta body type at night between 10 o'clock and 2, it needs cooling things. Uh, uh, one of the things that we found that's very good for pitta body types and for all body types is actually taking some hot milk before you go to bed. Uh, hot milk before you go to bed is kind of phenomenal. Believe it or not, it's an old grandma recipe. And we're talking about, you know, raw milk or vat pasteurized milk and non-homogenized milk. I'm definitely not talking about processed non-organic milk. And, and, and also want to say that it is not a requirement for anybody to drink milk. Uh, I, I do believe that, that uh, if you don't handle it well and you did as a child, then it's probably not the milk. It's probably indigestion or some weakness that needs to be addressed. But hot milk, and you can, if you want to supplement with coconut milk or almond milk, uh, it can be done as well. But the, but the actual cow's milk has certain peptides in it that have been shown to lower cortisol. And, lower, and therefore support sleep by 40%. So powerful tool. Now, in Ayurveda, you take that hot milk and you add into it these what were called ojas-building foods, okay? Ojas-building foods are really cool because they actually build the silence, the eye of the hurricane, the ability for us to connect up genetically with the circadian rhythms and the body begin to resonate with the, the, the micro and macrocosms to feel and, and, and function from these, these inner signals that I'm connected to these rhythms versus responding to signals that are saying, uh, life's an emergency, I can't hear these signals. You understand that? If your body is in such an emergency state, it won't hear this, or if you're under so much stress, it will trigger such an emergency alarm bell that you disconnect the genetic ability to hear these signals with our rhythms, and that includes our microbes as well. So, so ojas building foods, uh, ojas building activities, very similar to sattvic activities, are really important. Sleep, by the way, builds sattva. Um, hot milk with a little bit of crushed almond and ginger and ghee and raw honey and coconut and saffron, all these cooked into a, a formula and then drink that before, before you go to bed is phenomenal. I, I wrote an article about that with that recipe once and it's in my archives. As you guys know, we have like 400 free videos and articles that you can read about this. There's a whole section on insomnia. And um, I thought it was pretty cool. So I wrote this article about this old recipe based on the science about the milk proteins, right? And I put this article out and then um, a, my, one of my Indian distributors uh, herbal distributors or, or, or suppliers, herbal suppliers called me up and said, my grandmother used to make that milk for me. Thank you for reminding me. And he made it, sent me some canisters. He sent me some canisters of that formula uh, with all the dates, oh, dates or another one, dates and, and almonds and coconut and saffron and put it into a formula. And we actually over about six months or so created a product called the Ojas Nightly Tonic. And I gave that to a patient of mine um, who, uh, his wife came in a few months later and she said, my husband, I've been married like 25, six years, and he has never slept through the night as long as I've known him. He drank the hot milk with the Ojas herbs, the Ojas nightly tonic, and he slept for the first time than I've, than I've ever, I've first ever, I've never seen him sleep, sleep, sleep that way, sleep that well, or sleep through the night. And he was a very, very brilliant guy, just, you know, an absolutely brilliant man. And he just couldn't turn it off. You know, very pitta, very driven, and he just couldn't turn it off. So that's, you know, some of the things we want to do for the pitta the body types are cool them down and not let them get overstimulated. Coconut oil is very, very good to, you know, to have in your diet if you're a pitta person because that helps cool you down in the winter. It's also extremely valuable as well, as is ghee clarified butter, another one of those miraculous things, ghee is actually made, the major fatty acid in ghee called butyric acid, literally made in your intestinal tract by your own microbes. That's how important it is for your gut. And in Ayurveda, we use it for all of our cleanses and they've been using it for thousands of years. How they knew that, that, that the ghee was so critical to our own microbiology is, is mind boggling to me. Another type of insomnia is called the vata-based insomnia. Vata-based insomnia is when you can't sleep uh, through the night, and you wake up at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, and that becomes problematic. Um, um, 
And that's, again, usually caused by the lack of uh, deep energy to sedate yourself through the night. The pitta type is usually just sedating the pitta, um, but the vata one is usually sort of deep, deep exhaustion, if you know what I mean. So that's a factor. So we really want to understand how to do more deep, deep rejuvenation. And, you know, we have... um, uh, a couple of herbs for that. One herb, we have one called Sleep Easy, which has uh, Brahmi, which gives the nervous system the energy it needs to calm down. Uh, it's really good. That's really good for the pitta based insomnia. I mean, I give that alone. We have one herb called Brahmi Brain for that. Ashwagandha, an herb to give you deep, deep rejuvenation. And Skullcap and, and, and uh, Passion Flower, again, add adaptogens to really pay back that deep, deep debt. And you can take that herb like one or two of them at eight o'clock one to two more at 8.20, one to two more at 8.40, and then go to bed. Get your boring book out and go to, go to bed. You could even take that same formula in the morning and take it, you know, a couple or two or three of them in the morning to give you energy through the day and start doing deep, deep rejuvenation. If you have anxiety issues, there's another herb we have called Happy Caps, which is really great for building up the nervous system from the perspective of anxiety. And that has an herb that has Brahmi and Skullcap and Passionflower, an herb called Shampushpi, and another herb um, in it um, called Bacopa, which is really great for nervous system stability. So different herbs for different kinds of aspects of this, Brahmi for the Pitta base, ashwagandha, or um, ashwagandha alone, or sleep easy, or happy caps, or uh, for the deeper vata base insomnia, the Ojas Nightly Tonic for any of them, all very, very valuable, valuable tools. Uh, the yoga, the breathing, the meditation. We actually have the, some of the meditations, course, uh, the one minute meditations on my website, which is the first meditation we teach in our course uh, that's, that, that is available for you free. So you can get some of the first meditations free as part of um, the Transformational Awareness Technique introduction. So those are valuable, valuable tools to help rebuild the nervous system. Another thing to do um, before you go to bed in the early in the evening is a, take a nice hot shower. Take some herbalized Ayurvedic massage oil into the shower with you and put that on your skin. The nervous system on your skin is everywhere I touch on my skin, I feel it, right? So I have sensory nerve endings all over my body. And when I touch them, I stimulate them. But a lot of us are just so overstimulated, driving so much energy and, and therefore conti- contributing to the exhaustion that we are just so super stimulated. So by putting oil on the skin, it actually dampens the sensory experience and creates a volume down, calm down experience of the nervous system. It's profound, really profound. Like when you travel on a plane and you go to your hotel, put some oil on in the shower, and it just completely resets you. So you can do this in the shower, so you don't use very, very much oil. You don't make your towels all oily. Take a little bit of the oil, rub it all over your body, your head, try to get a lot on your head or your forehead or your face, and the bottoms of your feet are the areas where you want to focus. Put a lot of oil on if you can, you know, not, you don't need a lot is my point when you're in the shower, but you get some on so you have the oil on, pat yourself dry, Put some socks on your feet so the oil doesn't, you know, you want to put a little extra on there and then maybe even a little extra on your head and put some, and then put a cap on. Sounds crazy, you know, know, but, uh, and then you go to bed, um, you know, shortly thereafter with a hot cup of milk with dates and uh, coconut and ghee and raw honey and almonds and saffron. Powerful, powerful tools to help give you the energy to begin to start to calm yourself down. Uh, Powerful, powerful tool. So um, um, I think we're doing good. A couple of other things I wanna share with you um, is, uh, you know, in one study, they did a study with cognitive behavioral therapy. In Ayurveda, we call it critical analysis or self-inquiry. And they found that that when people did that, their sleep improved by 54%. Relaxation techniques increased sleep by 16%, and the placebo group increased sleep by only 12%. So, again, the importance of us to start to become more self-aware with the Ayurvedic basics, yoga, breathing, meditation. 
So you become more self-aware and then take action. Take action to free yourself from some of those old patterns. That's exactly what cognitive behavioral therapy is. That's what self-inquiry is. We have a whole four-day cleanse called the Lighten Up Cleanse, which is powerful. We have a whole series of videos to help guide people through a self-inquiry process. We put it in our Colorado Cleanse as part of the self-inquiry. I can't emphasize enough that once you become more self-aware and get your body to be more balanced, we have to then start to take a scrub, a scrubbing look, a discerning look at what this crazy mind is doing and then take action steps to make those changes. That is the nuts and bolts. And that is why Ayurveda exists, by the way, to, get, to make transformational change and free yourself from letting other people's behavior, other people's stress, situations, money, power, money, not having money, stressful things affect you. We become independent of the craziness. Uh, I love you, but it's no concern of yours. You're not only happy when they're loving you. You're happy because it's your nature to be joyful and loving. And this is something that we can't all do instantly, but it's a, it's, I think it's the game of life. And we play it, we start to see the body balance. And if we don't play it, we start stacking more stress, more stress, more stress to the point where we actually can't sleep. Our genes can't hear or listen to the rhythms. They, like, it's, it's beached whales. That's exactly what happens with beached whales. You throw enough electromagnetic currents into the oceans and the environment, the whales maybe can't listen any longer. They can't hear the rhythms and connect and guide. There's something that we, something very powerful and profound about us being connected to these rhythms and cycles of nature. Now, being just in nature is a powerful ojas builder. Um, giving, caring, loving, taking care of others, a powerful ojas builder. Not because you want something in return, though. And these ojas builders help us sleep uh, for sure. The last and final piece of, the, of, of our inability to sleep is sugar, blood sugar issues. We have one-third of the American population pre-diabetic. 90% of those folks, that's 90 million Americans, have no clue that it's happening. We eat meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, snack, and the body gets used to getting fed meal, snack, meal, snack, meal, snack. Then you say, okay, now I'm going to go to bed, and I'm going to sleep for nine hours. And the body goes, well, wait a minute, I have a feeding schedule. I get fed every two hours. When do we, how am I supposed to sleep through the night? So a lot of us, because we don't have the ability to make energy last and therefore burn fat, which is the stable, long-lasting, non-emergency fuel, we don't have that ability to burn fat through the night. So we stay wired for sound. And that's what happens, is we say we can't, we don't have the ability to, to, to burn fat and sleep through the night. Studies have shown that we're, human beings are supposed to go to sleep at night and burn fat all night long and break the fast, which is what happens when you break a fast, you burn a fat burning fast, in the morning with breakfast. That's, the word, that's where the word came from. But people don't go into fat burning anymore because we're eating meal snack, meal snack, stressed out so much, the cortisol levels aren't being naturally sedated by, by, by connecting to the nature, we're too stressed out and the nervous system gets stimulated, we become further depleted, and everything that we discuss happens. So when you eat meal snack, meal snack, meal snack, the body's blood sugar will not allow you to sleep through the night because sugar, if you're feeding on sugar, you need, every, you need a dose every two to three hours. If you're feeding on fat, you can go all day long. And that's the difference. You need to reset fat metabolism. And there's billions of ways to do that. I've written about this in so many ways in my website. I'm such a fanatic. My whole book, The Three Season Diet, is all about that, really. Um, so, but in brief, three meals a day, no snacks. Take time to eat your food. Don't eat on the run. Your bugs hate that, by the way. Uh, take time to relax and eat your food and see if you can start getting a habit of making supper a little earlier so you have more time to digest and settle down in the early evening. Make your early evenings more calm and more sattvic, and they are powerful pieces of the puzzle. When we talk about um, emotional uh, stressors that we can't shake, you know, a lot of times we just go to bed thinking and wound up and pining over the same old thing. Uh, in addition to meditation and self-inquiry exercises, um, and some of the herbs are great for helping the nervous system become more stable, Probiotics, powerful tools for that, because they we now know they support the mood stability, very, very powerful. 
but also even aromatherapy at night in your bed has been shown to be very profound. My favorite aromatherapy for people who have a lot of stress, emotional stress at night, is an, a, an essential oil called Melissa or lemon balm. It's a very beautiful smell, and it, but it's also specifically for the heart and the emotions. And so a very powerful support for the emotions. Other uh, uh, calming uh, essential oils that you can burn or diffuse at night while you sleep, uh, and particularly, you know, 7, 8 o'clock to get settled in. Chamomile, it makes a, a great essential oil, a beautiful smell. Lavender, and another one called marjoram, which is a natural muscle relaxer that helps calm, calm, calm you down. And any combination of those four are very, very powerful. So those are sort of all the tools that we have. I've got, I, I know, uh, lots and lots of questions, and I appreciate them all. I'm going to dive in here and, and see. I've got some questions here <coughs> printed out, so let me read them. Um, this is uh, from Great Barrington. I have temperature increases that wake me. They are different than hot flashes that are uh, now controlled by bioidentical hormones. Adjusted several times. They happen frequently at 7 to 7.30, uh, both a.m. and p.m. I need to sleep till 9 or I'm exhausted all day long. Um, sometimes what happens is during menopause is the, the, and this is a question that you would want to see. You know, there's an article that I'm going to point you to called the, um, um, what's it called? Uh, it might not be hormonal, where we talk about how the lymphatic system drains reproduction, and if you have a congested lymph due to poor digestion or stress, it can, and when you menstruate prior to the actual cycle, it can make your breast swell, swell uh, tender, you can swell, break out. This lymph system can back up and create problems. If that's been an underlying problem, which it is for many women, um, then the toxins when you go through menopause can default back to your liver and can predispose you to a hot flash. Now, you might be stable on one level with not the hot flashes, but that pushing of heat sounds to me like the liver is still not quite happy. And maybe it's lymphatic issues. So read my articles on lymph, swelling fingers, achiness, breast swelling tenders when you're menstruating prior, you know, in the earlier days. And, you know, decongesting your liver um, with herbs like liver repair, uh, making sure you're not constipated, the bile flow, all the bile movers we talk about, beets and apples and artichokes and pomegranates. These say flush that bile and get it to go down to help decongest your liver. Coconut oil being another good one to help cool yourself down as well. But I bet you that if we dug in here, that is probably some type of liver congestion that it was caused by a longstanding lymphatic congestion that's only now, well, you had the bioidentical hormone, so obviously we needed something, but now we have that that didn't quite fix all of it, is my guess. I pretty much eat, uh, eat I pretty much uh, um, wake, I wake pretty much each night between two and four, and I never feel rested in the morning. And this is the, the deep vata based insomnia between two, three, four, five, and six. That's the vata time of night. Uh, so that's why we call it the vata-based insomnia. Uh, menopause has intensified sleep de deprivation. I'm going to point you to the exact uh, question I just had. Uh, go to those articles I just mentioned. I have post-viral uh, Ross River fever from Australia, chronic fatigue syndrome for 10 years and diagnosed with mild sleep apnea. What do you recommend for those uh, extreme sleep interrupters? There's another question here about sleep apnea, so let's talk about that right now. I'm very excited to tell you that, you know, the book that I wrote called Body, Mind, and Sport, which is when we introduced nasal breathing exercise based on some research we did in 1993. I'm actually publishing, we did three studies. One of those is actually published now, in, has been published in the um, uh, International Journal of Neuroscience. But the other two studies were never released, and I'm releasing those. And I'm also releasing uh, a link to the other study so you can read all the research on nasal breathing. It's profound. Nasal breathing uses your nose to breathe all the way down into the lower lobes of your lungs where the calm nerves are. Powerful tool to tell your nervous system the war is over, that I'm not stressed out, that I, have, I don't have to pay all my, take all my energy to go pay off all this stressful debt. I can rebuild, rejuvenate, and give myself the energy I need to sedate myself. And in addition, nasal breathing, when you become uh, stressed, Rib cage gets tighter and tighter. I don't know if you can see me doing this. And as a result of the rib cage clamping down, we start breathing like little tiny rabbits, breathing 26,000 little breaths in the upper chest. And that's where the stress 
emergency fight or flight receptors are. So if you're breathing and you're only in your upper chest, you're breathing 26,000 emergency breaths per day, telling your body, yep, life is a 26,000 breath emergency, stress fighting, disease producing, lymphatic congesting, blood sugar stimulating emergency. And if you breathe into the lower lobe of your lungs, which your nose does for you, drives it down, you gain access to 80% of the, op, the, the oxygen in the blood for exchange, better waste removal, and calm nerves to calm you down. But what happened to most of us over the years, we get tighter, 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 tighter here, and we breathe like rabbits, and we start breathing through our mouth because we, and, and, and that's part of it, is when you breathe uh, in the upper chest, you breathe, become more mouth breathing sort of esque. When you breathe through the nose, you breathe into the lower lobes of your lungs naturally. So I'm going to tell you, if you've got sleep apnea, you got to learn how to breathe. And you can help to reverse that by getting your rib cage elastic with yoga and sun salutations and, and chest opening exercises. There's a ton we can do to support that and not just taking having to do a CPAP machine. But, but I've got a whole series, we're doing a whole series on fitness to relaunch my whole body, mind, body support, nasal breathing thing. Um, that's coming out in a couple of weeks. So tune into that. You know, and I've also got a whole fitness nasal breathing section on my website where tons of videos that I've did already. You can watch that, but 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 that's critical. I just don't see sleep apnea getting better if we have inability to breathe through our nose or more importantly, into the lower lobes of your lungs. So that's critical, okay? Um, what about getting a good night's sleep at an advanced age? My 86-year-old mom would love to sleep straight through the night but can't sleep more than three hours at a time. I wonder if she's got upper chest, sort of a little bit of apnea there. The Breathe Right strips, put them on, you know, those things you buy in the grocery store, they open up your airways, at least they say, in their studies by 30%, which gives you more nasal breathing activation of the calm nerves in the lower lobes of your lungs. As we get older, we get exhausted. We need to rebuild and reboot. Ashwagandha, Sleep Easy, Happy Caps, these are all herbs. Oh, just nightly tonic could be great for her. She probably remembers drinking hot milk before bed when she was a young girl. Those are really great techniques for her. Should be cutting out all the caffeine, including green tea, if we have sleep issues? Um, yes. Um, and the reason for that is, is that it isn't that caffeine is some terrible, evil thing. It is not sattvic, I have to tell you that. It is, um, but we don't have any studies to show that caffeine is bad for your bugs, at least not yet. Maybe they have it, but they're not telling anybody. Um, but it has, I haven't seen that. Uh, so we don't really know if the bugs like caffeine or not. We don't know. But we do know that caffeine is going to stimulate you. If you're, if you're using caffeine for energy, you're borrowing money to make energy you don't really have. And that is going to take you further into debt. And we want to, the real key to getting you to sleep well is to pay off the debt, right? That's the key. So that's critical. So yeah, I would try to get off of it the best you can. If you have a difficult time, do it as part of one of our cleanses because that's how people do it all the time because you're, you're in fat burning, which means you're calm. But if you're in sugar burning and you take away your major source of the up, then all you're gonna be experiencing is a lot of the down and that's very depressing, can give you headaches and withdrawal symptoms and things like that. But if you do it while you're in a cleanse where we make you get into fat burning to help reset function, you have a better shot of making it a permanent experience. Uh, what's your, uh, your view on using low doses of released melatonin to get better sleep? I don't think it's a bad thing for, for jet lag when you're traveling and things like that. I think it sort of tries to help get the genetic, the, the genes to listen to the rhythms, the circadian rhythms. And I think that there is some definite value there. I don't, I'm not against it, but I, I'm against it long term. Uh, but I, and I'm okay with it short term. What's your view of tryptophan supplements as a precursor to helping the body, you know, sedate itself and get to sleep? Again, I'm not used to. I'm not. I'm not against that either. But I am against. Here's what I'm against. Um, you know, another question I think came up because I'm gonna hear about 5-HTP and um, what is it, GABA and 5-HT to help reduce anxiety so I can get to sleep. Here's my problem with herbal extracts. I just wrote an article this weekend called A Thousand Reasons to Avoid Herbal Extracts. And it turns out that, that extracts, when you make an extract, an herbal extract, you kill all the microbes. And whole herbs have all the microbes. And so much of the intelligence of the plant is in the microbes. So it's very important to understand that. 
when you are only using extracts, there's sort of an overrule that takes place when you take those supplements. You're stimulating your body, overruling the intelligence, doing the job for the body in a somewhat natural way. But the body knows it's not natural. It knows it's being stimulated and eventually builds what's called a tolerance. And a lot of times the, the herb or the herbal extract, herbal extract or the amino acid doesn't continue to work. And that's my concern. You know, in nature, you don't get that concentration of tryptophan in the bloodstream blasting into the brain into the chemistry into the blood chemistry into the brain chemistry all at once it doesn't happen so there's a chance that the body could respond to that as an overwhelm and therefore build tolerance and then the product stops working for you but i am all for all of those products for short-term reset benefit i'm not against herbal extracts at all i just think that they're great short-term use but long term, I believe we really want something as close to nature as possible. And those are whole herbs. Now, even the whole herbs, when you, unless you eat them fresh out of the ground, they do lose some constituents, but they have all the microbes. Well, not maybe not all, but, uh, the, but we haven't done anything to destroy the microbiology and the herbal intelligence is intact as a full spectrum blueprint of the plant. I think that's powerfully and powerfully important. Um, uh, another question about elderly, um, is it, old folks can sleep great. And I think that the stuff that we've talked about already tonight um, can help people, uh, you know, get back to that. Usually there's a level of fatigue and exhaustion and lymph congestion and lack of deep breathing ability. And they can get out and walk and learn how to breathe through the nose just like the rest of us. Um, what do you do with night sweats? Night sweats are again usually caused by menstrual related issues or menopausal related issues and they are uh, uh, very, very powerful. Um, uh, again, same rules apply. Let's look at the liver, let's look at the history of lymph and I've written a lot about that as well. Now I know this call was supposed to be an hour and I apologize for going over a little bit. Um, I'm going to stay on the call for just a little bit longer and, and answer some questions. I'm going to go to the phones and do a little bit more uh, question answering because I know you have a lot of questions here. But if you got to go, I respect the, uh, your time and please know that uh, uh, I appreciate you listening. And I'm going to sort of officially end the call now. And if you want to hang on and listen longer to answer, listen to these questions, please absolutely feel free. Uh, if you have a question, push star two on your phone and. Uh, um, yeah, your phone, right? Yeah, on your phone, and uh, and I'll pick up and we'll we'll chat together live. Uh, another question here: um, End of the day, frontal sinus headaches, dizzy, nauseous, eye sensitive to light is keeping me awake uh, during this change to cold weather. What can calm both my vata and my pitta in this regard? Um, well. Um, One of the things that jumps makes me think that this is a maybe a, makes me think about vitamin D is when I listen to this question. Vitamin D is very powerful for connecting us to the rhythms of nature. 80, 90, 87% of people in America are deficient in vitamin D. The sun is crashing in the sky. People with vitamin D levels are plummeting as we speak. Make darn sure your numbers are between 50 and 80 nanograms per milliliter. That's the number that you need to get functional hormonal function from your vitamin D, very, very important. 30 is the normal limit, so you're, you might be 35, your doctor says you're fine. You really need to get that number up a notch or two. Usually people need four to 5,000 international units of vitamin D per day to make that happen. The benefits of sleep and vitamin D are critical. Oh, I mentioned a lot of stuff that'll help Vata and Pitta, but I didn't mention vitamin D, and that's critical. And this is a, this this question makes me think vitamin D straight up. So get a, you know we have a home uh, vitamin D test if you don't have a doctor, you don't want to get can't get it tested easily. We have a home test kit you can get your vitamin D levels checked. Make darn sure that you uh, are your numbers are between uh, 50 and 80 uh, nanograms per milliliter. That is very important in the winter time. Um, Let's see here. Um, I'm struggling. I struggle with waking in the night and being unable to go back to sleep. I read an article about adrenal cocktail being helpful. It's made of uh, orange juice, uh, one half teas cream of tartar sea salt. Uh, is ingesting that much cream of tartar okay? 
Uh, also read that gelatin is very helpful. I haven't, no, I haven't seen any of these. This is interesting. So many. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think that it's harmful to try these things at all. Um, but I think that be careful when we, when we start talking about adrenal cocktails because a lot of times what we try to do is we just in, drive the adrenals with more energy so they can make more stress fighting hormones so you can be more calm. But again, when you stimulate your adrenals to make energy it doesn't really have, and again, at a deeper level, you're going further into debt. So be careful of adrenal stimulation. Um, and then I don't think that that, I mean, I would give that a whirl and see how you do. I don't know what the result would be. I'm curious, you know, if you get the, if you have the energy, give me an email and let me know how that works. Um, um, if one is in menopause, somewhat stressed and has, been, has sleeping issues of either not being able to fall asleep sometimes or waking up only after three and four hours, do you recommend Shatavri, Brahmi, and Ashwagandha? Shatavri is another herb that's a great ojas builder, so it can be added to the mix. Ashwagandha and Shatavri, by the way, just so you know, are the two major ojas building herbs. So those are the ones, plus the nuts, the, the almonds, and the coconut, and the saffron, and the dates, and the ghee, and the honey, and the milk. Those are all ojas builders. So those are powerful to know about. Um, Read the article about the Ojas Nightly Tonic. You'll learn more about all that research. I already take Tulsi, do yoga, meditate, have taken Ashwagandha, Brahmi, Shatavri, but no, don't notice any difference. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe I didn't take them long enough. You also tried 5-HTP, GABA, Magnolia, Magnesium, Skullcap, Passionflower, Tryptophan. Thank you. Um, um, here's a situation where you got to check the basics like vitamin D, make sure that's not a problem. In perimenopause, you have issues where the 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 energy ayurvedically we talk about going down into the pelvis is now actually not going down; it's actually going up. And what can happen is that all the impurities or the or the hormones are being detoxified through the liver. The liver gets hot, and it can bring heat up into the head and the neck and cause hot flashes. So when I see a situation like all this stuff not working, it makes me think that there's maybe a liver issue here, a you know, a kind of a menopausal issue that may be a factor, or a underlying emotional stressful issue here as well that might require some self-inquiry or meditation and self-inquiry like we talk about in the TAT um, or uh, transformation awareness technique that is. Uh, but something either is going on in your liver or the vitamin D, a deficiency. Vitamin and B12, by the way, another piece of the puzzle here is a is a precursor to to um, uh, melatonin, which helps us sleep as well. So that's important to make sure you're not B12 deficient. So that's it. And vitamin D and B12 deficiencies are both deficiencies that affect more than half the world's population. So they're not uncommon. So those are important pieces to look at. Uh, I'm going to go to the phones and see who's on the phone. Um, okay, so in um, Santa Rosa, California, are you there? Hi, Dr. Son. Hi. Hi, um, let's see, I did the Colorado cleanse and I was upping my amount of water that I was drinking and I've been finding that I have to get up throughout the night and go to the bathroom like three times a night. So I'm just wondering if you can help me out with that one. Should right. I stop drinking fluids at a certain time before in the early evening? Or like Could you say that again? I'm sorry. I was distracted. Could you repeat that? Somebody's uh, cell phone is uh, ringing. Okay, I, but yeah, I can't find it. My issue is that I'm um, having to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and eat quite a bit. All right. So, so say, say it again. I'm trying to find this phone that's ringing. But I... Oh, take it outside. Okay, I'm saying it again. I'm sorry. It's my iPad ringing. My iPad's never rang before in my whole life, so now it's ringing. Who knew? Who knew it could ring? Um, I didn't know it could ring. All right, say it again, please. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I did the Colorado plant, and I was doing lots of hydration um, and upping my hydration therapy. And I have noticed that I've had to uh, go to the bathroom quite a bit during the night. Like, um, yeah. I would get up. At midnight and three in the morning and six in the morning to go pee. So, 
Should I stop drinking fluids earlier in the evening, or is there a cutoff time? Or yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, obviously, if it's big, waking up at night is important. Now, there is the, there is um, a concept that says that if you actually, you know, drink a lot of water, the bladder gets used to expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting, and that's valuable. So you don't end up with a very kind of um, kind of reactive bladder where you, where you have to go all the time. You know what I mean? So, and one way to help that is with sipping of hot water, um, and uh, that's a technique to help, you know, get you the hydration, but sort of rehydrate your system that way, and maybe do that with the water, do a little bit more water during the day, less water at night, and see if you can get around that. But obviously, uh, if it's disturbing your sleep, you don't want to have it continue, okay? Okay, thank you. You betcha, thank you. All right, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hear me? Hi, Dr. John. Um, I have a question about my daughter. She, I, was, um, I did a consultation with Fauna, and she was helping me. She has anxiety, and she has a hard time falling asleep, and I just changed her going to bed time to 8 o'clock, but she won't fall asleep without melatonin. And I do give her ashwagandha too, but I don't know, maybe I'm not doing it consistent enough or not enough. How old is she? She's nine. And where does she sleep? Um, uh, can you say it again? I didn't what, where, where does she sleep? In her room. Uh-huh. And how long has she not been sleeping well? Oh, she, most of her life, she, oh, well, maybe since she was five, she's, she has anxiety and she just hurts. She's complaining that her thoughts just keep her awake and she can't fall asleep. Let me ask you this. Was there any correlation between her moving into her own room and not sleeping around five years old or so? No. No, it has to do with our divorce, so she's very hmm. anxious about that. And well, she always had, she slept alone in her room and she was fine. Yeah, and then the divorce could sort of possibly trigger, you know, that survival abandonment, you know, tendency. And a lot of kids come in with that. You know, it's not like, you know, it's weird. I wrote a couple articles about this I thought were fascinating, right, where they took a mouse and then they, they taught it how to be afraid of peppermint oil. And then the mouse grew up always afraid of peppermint oil. And then the mouse had babies. And then the babies grew up. And the babies were, were then exposed to peppermint oil as adults, and they freaked out. Yeah, I did, I did uh, hear about that. So, so, so my point is, is that this stress of abandonment and needing to be nurtured or being safe could be you know, coming in generally, generationally, or it could be something that's only because of the divorce, but she probably needs to be really, you know, nurtured. And I don't think it's, you know, if you could, you know, bring her into your room or maybe put an extra bed in your room where you guys go to bed together, you know, something along those lines where she feels really supported and not alone at night might help. Uh, and then all the things we talked about tonight, the massage, the oil massage, teaching her, a nine-year-old girl, to meditate is, is, is doable. Um, they can do the one-minute meditation. If you go to my website and just, just Google I, web, web, web search. I just tried. She, she's also, I think she has dyslexia. She can't repeat anything, so I would just try to do it. I'm sitting there breathing, and she's with her eyes open, rummaging through her. So she wouldn't have sit still for a minute for me, but I tried, and I'm, I wanted to try to make it a routine. Yeah, and maybe, you know, the other one that might be more, would be something like the happy caps, which is geared more towards the psychology, you know, geared more towards the emotional aspect. That might be something for her uh, as well that might be more valuable, because um, that's that sounds to me the Melissa at night, like I said, is very emotional, and supportive for her to sleep with at night. Uh, the Ayurvedic massage, you know, you're gonna have to team up on doing something, anything you can to make her feel safe. That sounds like what happened is that disturbed her and shook her building, and she hasn't recovered from that. You know, I, everything you're doing, the, the ashwagandha and the deep rejuvenative part is part one, but then we have to somehow support her emotionally as well. Okay. Melissa, to massage Melissa into the soles of her feet? Or you could do that, or you could just diffuse it in the air, or you could do both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, you're very welcome. Thanks for the call. 
Okay, in, uh, in West Los Angeles, are you there? Yes. Yes, yes. Me? Yes, yes. Um, yes. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I was advised um, by a medical intuitive to do uh, progesterone cream actually to help with some heart palpitations, which I just really detected just when I went to get blood, they, when they check it manually, they do something. And she said also it would help to sleep better. Well, recently, um, I'm waking up every hour or two, and whether or not I need to pee or not, which I, I need to pee a few times during the night, but I'm waking up really frequently, and I'm not sure if I don't have caffeine late, I don't have much caffeine anyway, um, I do maybe need to clean tea in the early morning. So, um, Did you say that the progesterone uh, they gave you for the heart palpitations? blood tests and stress tests and I didn't find anything and and because um, I had been through menopause maybe like maybe that time about eight uh, eight years earlier and she suggested that I do progesterone cream six nights a week and actually um, I still have the palpitations but did it help um, not with the palpitations I think it did at the time it did help Actually, a little bit better with sleeping, although I wasn't having an issue with it, but I think it did, it did help. But it didn't help your sleep? It did help a little, yeah. A little bit. But I didn't have the issues then, really. It wasn't, but it did make it better. And then it got worse. Um, but now I just, um, it's just recent, and I just, I'm really I'm waking up every hour or two, so I feel like maybe there's something that I'm not acknowledging. Are you still taking the progesterone? I'm sorry? Are you still taking the progesterone? So you stopped it to make sure that it wasn't the progesterone. No, I stopped because I, I, I'm not sure why I stopped. I just wasn't getting myself to do it for a little, you know, for a few months, and then I went back on it. Well, the thing to do is to make sure go off the, you know, rule out that the, that the progesterone is not causing you to sleep every, wake up every hour by going off of it for a couple of weeks and seeing if that makes a difference, because it might be, you know, overstimulating you in some way, because it is a precursor to those to stress fighting hormones, so it will support adrenal function. It could be driving the adrenals to a certain extent. So you want to make sure that that's not a factor. Um, but if the progesterone helps you initially, it's going to give the, the adrenals the, the, you know, some support, but it could then overstimulate them. So, you know, a little is good, a lot might not be so good, or, you know, you might have not needed so much. You might have overshot that runway a little bit. Um, it's hard to say, but I would definitely experiment with not doing the progesterone and then look at deeper ways of rebuilding and rejuvenating the nervous system and the adrenals like herbs like ashwagandha, Tulsi tea is really good, um, the Ojas building tonic is really, really good, um, uh, the, the Sleep Easy, which has the passion flower and the, uh, the, and the skull cap and the Brahmi and the ashwagandha, those are all deep, deep rejuvenatives that are very, very valuable. Uh, and that's what I would continue to do, but I would rule out whether that progesterone is helping or hurting at this point. Okay? Okay. Now, ashwagandha, I do that in the morning. Should I do that multiple times? Or? Well, you can do the ashwagandha. You know, you might think about doing the ashwagandha in the morning, maybe breakfast and lunch even, to get deeper rejuvenation, and then do the sleep easy at nighttime, like I said, because sleep easy is is a, a, a little bit more reliable. It has ashwagandha in it, but it has the other herbs in it that are very good for sleep. Yeah, yeah, sure can. Okay. okay, excellent. All right, and yeah, let me know how that works out, okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, are you there? Yes, is it, here, is it me? I can hear you. Okay, uh, a couple of things. What do you know about astragalus? Astragalus is another good one. It's a warm, heavy, sweet root. It doesn't have the neuro, it has a very good immune booster, and, and it is an adaptogen, but sort of more geared for immunity. And ashwagandha is an adaptogen geared, it has great immune benefits as well, but it also has the, uh, the deep rejuvenative adrenal benefits as well. But I think astragalus is a great addition to the adaptogenic list for sure. I think they've, they've been shown in studies that I've seen a while back that increase lymphocyte activity. I think it's great. I think that's one of the best uses of castor oil. And then this is a, kind of a funny question, but what are the best times for 
for sex, and I'm sure there's Gothic sex and Pitta sex and stuff like that, but um, I, I'm curious what, uh, how Ayurveda looks at that. Um, well, I think that the, 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 there's many takes on that, but um, definitely uh, in, the, in the early part of the evening, uh, is the best time for sex. In the, in the kapha time of the day, before in the early part of the evening is the best time. That's the kapha time of day, and, uh, and then and that, that's considered one of the best times to have sex. Okay. Does that, that help you relax? Yeah, it's good for insomnia, probably. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and in Deerfield, Illinois, are you there? Yes, I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Um, I wanted to go back to sleep apnea. You mentioned it. Okay, yeah. A little bit, it was a little bit muffled. Um, oh. and I, I have it, and I also don't sleep long. I just got off okay. CPAP, um, but I, I would love to get off the CPAP. I don't particularly like it. It helps, it helps me a little teeny bit, and my numbers are a little better, but it doesn't make me feel rested in the morning. And I only sleep on it five to six hours. And before I had it, I only slept four to five hours, so I, I need to sleep longer. Yeah. I need, and I need to get, and I need to heal my sleep apnea and start sleeping like a natural person. Yeah. No, I I hear you, and 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 I, I can't say that this is a a hundred percent cure for this by any means, but I what I said was that. I don't really think that we're going to get much traction with sleep apnea unless we learn how to breathe into the lower lobes of the lungs and develop what's called full respiratory capacity. And the nasal breathing is a powerful tool to breathe 26,000 times a day into those lower lobes of your lungs if we learn how to breathe. And that's with nasal breathing exercise, nasal breathing walking, the breathe right strips. Uh, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of articles and a whole bunch of new ones coming uh, on nasal breathing in the next week or two uh, all about that that are I think really exciting about all the research that's been done on it uh, but very powerful and I think that's going to be an important piece of the puzzle to open up your rib cage the sun salutation exercise rib opening exercises like lying over like a styrofoam roller with your underneath your back and arching your back and getting that rib cage open and elastic in my opinion, and then learning how to nasal breathe is a powerful piece of that puzzle. There's other factors that will come into play, stress and different you know, issues, you know, a lot of which we're talking about. You know, this comes when you force yourself to breathe up, that's an emergency response to life. And that means that there's stress involved. Again, as we read all those studies, it's always about stress. And then so we want to think about how do we rebuild from that stress, pay back the debt from that stress, with either OGIS builders or uh, adaptogenic herbal support and a sattvic lifestyle, all that comes into play. Um, so, what what would be good? So, go on your website and start learning about nasal breathing. That's right. There's a whole section on the there's a, there's a bunch of videos and articles on nasal breathing uh, in the fitness nasal breathing section. So, go there for sure. Oh yeah, well then there you go, right there. And that will change with deeper, you know, that's why, that's what nasal breathing is about, is to gain access to where all the blood is, and where all the oxygen and is. I'm, and I'm very overweight as well, and it's hard to lose weight when you're this tired, but you know, some, there has to be an inner a path in somewhere. But you can go for a walk and breathe through your nose, and you can, you know, there's, you can start, you just baby steps, you know what I mean? You know, and and uh, you know, and if you need help, to hold your hand. We do consultations. I can do it, or Tana can do it. We can hold your hand and guide you through this process. But, 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 you know, there's a lot of potential gain to be had. I believe. Okay. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, hang in there. All right. Yeah. No, I'm going to do this. Okay. Good deal. Talk to you soon. All right, I'm going to go back to the uh, questions here a little bit here. Good, got, got that one done. Is adrenal fatigue, <coughs> excuse me, and early menopause, um, around 45, reason for waking numerous times through the night? Adrenal fatigue is, early menopause isn't, shouldn't be, if you've, if you're, you know, kind of been there, done that, 
um, uh, menopause should be should have either caused and did its created its problems, and now we should be you know hopefully moved on by by then. But it can be a problem, like I said in some of the earlier calls, that you can have menopausal issues, adren uh, hormones trying to be toxified, detoxified through the liver, and that can be problematic. Adrenal fatigue for sure can be, and that's all the things we talked about, adaptogenic herbs, all the things we talked about for sure. Thanks for that uh, question. Uh, I woke up once or twice during the night each time I sleep. I've read that this is fairly typical for most people, and if you can quickly return to sleep, it's not concerning. It seems historical. It's difficult to go for eight hours with no interruptions, lightning storms being one example. What are your thoughts on this? It's true that the studies that I've read show that if you can get back to sleep quickly, it's not a big deal. You, you know, um, there's, there's certain phases of the sleep that are very, very light, and you can wake up and toss and turn and go back to sleep. It's not a big deal. If lightning storms are the things, and I don't know where you live where there's that many lightning storms, but there's other factors, you know, light outside, you know, uh, the electromagnetics in your house, having a master Wi-Fi switch to turn all that off, all your cell phones to power them off so they're not like little satellite signals bringing in, you know, internet signals into your house. Those are all, all those are subtle things. And then of course, maybe the OGIS building at night. So hopefully I've given you a, a big buffet here tonight where you can kind of choose from all these things that, uh, that might actually help you. But uh, hopefully that'll help you out there. Um, what do you do when you wake up at uh, 3 or 4 a.m. and can't get fully back to sleep? Again, that is a vata-based insomnia. And we talked about all the strategies there. I'm not going to go back over that. But uh, again, that's all the vata-based insomnia things we talked about doing. Um, I'm a lifelong side sleeper. Now I get pressure or pain under my arms, which wakes me up uh, every couple of hours. I find it hard to sleep on my back or the Ayurvedic solution. Um, <clears throat> if you're a, a side sleeper and now you can't because you get pressure, um, I would look at maybe there's a, a technique that I used to use when I was doing chiropractic, active release technique. It's a muscle release technique to release the muscles, free up the rib cage, so you can actually you know sleep more comfortably at night. It's very common that people don't sleep well because they're uncomfortable in their body because their muscles have lost a certain level of elasticity. So that's what I would do, of course, you know, because it seems more of a biomechanical thing than anything else so so maybe take a look at that as well um, i'm curious about research that says optimal physical repair happens between 10 o'clock and 2 and psychogenic between 2 and 6 is this true i haven't seen those studies so i can't necessarily comment on the studies but i can tell you from the ayurvedic perspective between 10 o'clock the liver is becoming very active to detoxify and to do repair um, so physical repair, so that makes sense from that perspective. Between two o'clock and six, it's psychogenic um, support. Well, we know that that's the vata time of night, and that's when the vata is most active to support and, and do rebuilding and support for the nervous system. So it does make sense. I haven't seen studies that say that. I'd be curious to know if there's studies behind that because I, I love to document. Um, these are very tied into the Ayurvedic rhythms of nature cycles of daily cycles and if there are studies i'd love to see them because um, that's what we do right always trying to prove ancient wisdom with modern science studies i love that so if you have them send them to me thank you um, if you took just one of the products which one would you suggest well if you have pitta based insomnia can't get to sleep take brahmi brain before you go to bed if you have vata based insomnia and therefore wake up in the wee hours of night two three four five or six uh, uh, not six, but you know, three or four ish, then take the sleep easy. Uh, that's that general rule that we go by initially. And then of course there's additional factors that we sometimes have to tweak, but that's the, what, where we, that's where I start. Um, I've been diagnosed with severe sleep apnea, overweight. I'm finding sleep, the sleep apnea machine very, very difficult. Again, I, 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 I just answered that question. The last phone call I did Please, you know, let's, you know, create a team of people to get off these CPAP machines and get nasal breathing, get walking. I'm going to put a lot of energy into helping people learn how to nasal breathe again. Um, really kind of somehow, I don't know why, but re-motivated to release all the original research we did 
way back when about nasal breathing. It's profound. What happened was I actually stumbled upon the old study about a month ago and I got so excited, I forgot about half the stuff that we did. And it just blew my mind. It was 23 years ago. And I was like, and I'm reading a lot of this new information about exercise and the zone and, and brain waves. And I'm going, we did this 23 years ago and it was better what we did and more profound what we did when we did, when we did nasal breathing research. So I'm really excited about letting everybody know how profound it is when you learn how to be a good nasal breather. Um, thank you for that. Uh, what is the most effective dose of ashwagandha for calming the central nervous system? Um, you know, 500 milligrams in the morning with breakfast, um, 500 with lunch, and 500 with supper. Okay, so always using the whole herb is my preference. Um, is there a connection between digestion and sleep? You're darn right it is, because digestion means blood sugar, and blood sugar means sleep. We talked about blood sugar, how important it is. So if you don't digest well, you know, certain things, you probably aren't delivering stable blood sugar either, and that means fats to stabilize your mood, and sugars that we become dependent on to go up and down, and that creates that, that dependency on being fed more frequently. So there's a huge connection between sleep and digestion. Um, hopefully I went over that sufficiently. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, why do people grind their teeth while sleeping? How can you stop that? Okay, um, stress is probably the best answer for that. The muscles in your neck, if they're not being supported properly, a lot of people have a lot of neck problems, that clamp down on your neck and it causes tension in your cranial bones. And your cranial bones become very tight and they're supposed to breathe and move. And then the only movable bone in your head is your jaw. And then your jaw starts to take up the tension from the neck to the cranial bones, which stop moving and breathing, and they start to move here. And it creates the jaw to be the only one that we can sort of unravel some of that tension. There's a little, and I should do a video on this because I'm not going to necessarily do it here, but there's a video, um, I should do it, but it's a technique where inside your mouth up and through here, right between your cheek and gum, there's a muscle called the pterygoid muscle, and you get your finger up in there, and you massage that muscle, and you release your pterygoids, and very often it relaxes all this stress, and people stop grinding their teeth. Really super easy technique. I promise you I'll do a, a teeth grinding article and video for that. It's pretty cool. Okay, thank you. Um, daughter has a new baby. Has How do new moms feel more refreshed? The Ojas Nightly Tonic. My wife, after six kids, she lived on that stuff. That is an Ayurvedic recipe. In addition to for helping people sleep, it's the number one Ayurvedic food for mom, new, newborn moms because it's super easy to digest. They want to rebuild their Ojas. It's a powerful, powerful tool for them to rebuild. Ashwagandha and Shatavri, Ojas building herbs to rebuild. Shatavri means woman with 100 husbands. It rebuilds reproductive strength. Ashwagandha rebuilds stamina, reserve, endurance, and adrenal support. So those two, Ashwagandha, Shatavri, and the Ojas nightly tonic. Got to do that if you just had a baby. And then reboot digestion on top of that, either with warm digest or gentle digest, depending on how sensitive your digestion is. Those are the basics for moms who just had a baby. Um, how quickly does ashwagandha start working? You know, ashwagandha um, can work very quickly, or it can, depending on how deeply, how deeply in debt you are and how, how much reserve we lack. So those are important factors. So it's hard to really say. Good question, though. Uh, when I was younger, I slept very soundly. I'm now 59 years old and have great difficulty staying asleep. When I wake, my mind rolls through everything I can possibly think of. Uh, do you think this is age-related? I'm not going to do the age-related thing anymore for you guys because there is no excuse for anything that I'm going to blame on age, ever. Okay? We should be vital as we age, not get old, can't sleep, can't think. I, you know, hopefully I'll be able to think as we go here. Um, but um, I just don't want to go there. And I really believe that we have to fight for, for aging gracefully and not, you know, blaming sleep or whatever on age. I'm just sort of kidding, but, but, but really, I think we all need to just, you know, really get it that we can fight back against the aging process, which is usually, as, you, know, you know, a little on the yucky side because we have some imbalances we've carried into our old age, and it's not the old age that's actually causing the problem. I would suggest that, that all the stuff we talked about today, you know, so many of the pieces of the puzzle can help you kind of reverse that. 
Thank you for uh, that question. Can the practice of yoga nidra <coughs> help? Yes, that was one study that showed that those relaxation techniques are very profound. I think it was 16% improvement of sleep based on some of the relaxation techniques. Although some people are going to do way better. So it just depends, you know. Um, but I would definitely try that for sure. I fall asleep easily about 9.30, wake up around 2 to 3 a.m. Can I fall back asleep uh, for two hours? Any suggestions? Again, this is sort of a, a pitta sort of slash vata imbalance. We're not really sure which it is. So what you could do is you could do, um, the, you do the, you know, the, the sleep easy in the morning and the brahmi in the morning, and you can do the sleep easy and the brahmi at night. You can take them both together and, and get a little bit more of a deeper rebuilding. That works really well as well. Um, I live on the edge of a time zone, or the circadian uh, are the circadian rhythms, liver phases strictly rooted to the times you mentioned? Not really, but a couple of, it really depends. Like in the, in the winter, the nights are, 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 of course, much longer. In the summer, they're very shorter. So this time sort of expand and contract. And I think the best way to really find out your time zone is just to, you know, get settled in seven, six or seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night. And then, you know, just watch yourself begin to start to get overstimulated. When you start getting a little bit wired and start wanting to change the world, then you know that, uh, you know, on the computer, then you know that's the time. Usually it's between 9 to 10 o'clock, somewhere in there, you start to feel that kick in of energy. Um, uh, but if you're in balance, the idea is you actually don't feel the kick in of energy. You actually feel tired and you actually then will feel a bit feel uh, better to go to sleep. Good question coming here. Is valerian root considered a sedative? Yes, it is. Um, can you use it with ashwagandha? Yes, you can. It's it's fine to combine them. I prefer not to use sedatives, but valerian, if you use the whole herb, not the extract, it's much more mitigated and it can be a reasonably uh, appropriate way to help get you some of that sleep that you might need to help settle yourself down. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed. I don't use it, but I'm not opposed to it. Um, any any contraindications for Brahmi ashwagandha for an older person with heart meds? Um, no, there shouldn't be. Always then, in more so when you're on medication, use whole herbs, not extracts, because whole herbs don't interact at all with medications. They're just like foods. Brahmi and ashwagandha was thrown in soups and stews in the wintertime, eaten and put, in the, put, in, put into their salads in the summer. The Brahmi was ashwagandha was a root thrown in the soups and stews. It was a food in ancient times, so something very very safe for us to eat when as a whole herb. So I would always look to do that versus a uh, an extract. And of course that's what we use in our Life Bar Organics line. It's all whole herbs uh, that way as well. Last question: uh, Can you add turmeric to the milk? Yes, you can add turmeric to the milk. It's not an ojus builder. But it's uh, very good for help break up the congestion of the milk if you're worried about getting a little congested. The ginger and the turmeric, neither one of those are ojus builders, but they're good for the congestion and turmeric, so good for so many things. Uh, well, everyone, um, I ran out of at least this batch of questions. Uh, we'll try to answer any re residual ones I missed uh, via email. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you uh, next month when we do our talk on cravings. Uh, and, and please, you know, look for the new research coming up on the fitness uh, program, and uh, we will talk to you very soon. Thank you.